Ready. Okay, hi, welcome, good evening. Um, tonight's topic, tonight's share, it's called This Way Up, Discovering Your Path to Greatness. My name is Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Bregman. I'm the director and the founder of an organization called the uh, Jewish Executive Learning Network, which is based out of Lakewood, New Jersey. I learn with young professional men in their 20s and 30s throughout the New York area. It's a pleasure to meet you. I'm honored to be here. I, I thank uh, uh, Rebbe Aniv and Chazak for uh, inviting me and for uh, welcoming me. This is not my first time here, but it's a pleasure to be back. The first time they have you, you hope, uh, you hope it works. But the second time they have you, then you know the first time was okay. I also thank Torah Anytime as well for filming this week's, uh, this week's shear. They fill the shiurim every week and make them available to a broad range of people. I appreciate that enormously as well. Um, we're going to cover a lot of information tonight in the next hour or so. Um, I would just ask if you have any questions, try to please hold them to the end, and uh, I'll stay with you as long as you like afterwards to clarify. Those of you who are used to my style know what we're uh, in for. What I'm going to be presenting with you tonight is a lot of different ideas and different things a person can work on to achieve greatness as a Jew and as a human being and to begin to discover that path, to have tools to work on. I, I don't think I'm the, the greatest human being or Jew in the world, but these are things that I'm working on, and the Torah promises that if these are things you work on, you'll head in the right direction. The first thing I'd like to speak about tonight is the need for a person to have a Rebbe, to have a person to serve as their mentor in life, that's crucial as a prerequisite to going in the derech of greatness. Now, I'll tackle it from this angle tonight, a little bit of a novel approach. Have you ever thought of or heard of the question, which is discussed in the Torah, and the question is, how old was Adam Arishain, how old was Adam, the first person, when Hashem made him? How old did he look? If you were there, how old would he have looked? Would he have looked like he was 20? Would Adam have looked like he was 55? How old was Adam? So we don't know for sure how old he looked, but the Gemara, the Gemara discusses in Tractate Rosh Hashanah, Daf Yur Aleph Amar Aleph, page 11a, the Gemara discusses this in Tractate Rosh Hashanah, it's discussed. And the Talmud tells us over there that everything Hashem made in creation, He made it complete. It was full, it was done. The language in the Talmud translated to English is that everything Hashem made was created with its full stature, with its full intelligence, and with its full measure of beauty. Why was it? Why did Hashem, everything He made, He made it done, He made it complete. So the simple answer, they say, is that because if He didn't, you know, the world wouldn't work. If Hashem had made Adam a baby, right, you know, let's say three weeks old, He would have uh, starved to death, you know. And if He made a little bird and that no, had no big, you know, big birds to bring it worms or whatever else, it, the world wouldn't work. So that's a simple reason why Hashem made it that way. And, but the deeper reason of Mepharshim, the commentaries explain, is that Adam and Adam had to be born and created into a complete world. Because if Adam didn't know what the world was supposed to look like, what the completed project and product, uh, what it was supposed to be like, he would never be able to even begin to work and create towards duplicating that again. Right? Because it's only when you have the completed idea in front of you, you can even begin to start to make it and create it, right? Because you have to have a picture first so you can get out of the starting gate, right? I'll give you another example where we speak about this. We speak about this in the Torah later on by Moshe Rabbeinu. Where does it say this? It's the Medrash. The Medrash speaks about it. And Medrash Tanchuma, Parshas Baloischa, when Moshe is commanded by Hashem to make the menorah. To make a menorah. What happens? He tells him to, to make the menorah. But, but Hashem tells him to make the menorah, and at first Moshe doesn't really know what it is. So the Medrash says Hashem shows him like a picture in, in, made out of ash, out of fire, what the menorah is supposed to look like, how he's supposed to make it, right? So he tries, and Moshe still wasn't able to make it. So what happened? So what happened was, Hashem actually says, okay, fine, you basically take the gold and throw it in the fire, and it's going to make itself on its own. And that's why the Torah says that it, the mitzvah in the Torah doesn't say, make the menorah. The Torah expresses that the menorah shall be made. It expresses it in a passive tense. Why? Because the menorah was made on its own. So what do I want from this? What, I'll explain where I'm really going with this, and you'll understand. The question is, why was it, why was it that Hashem asked Moshe to make the menorah if he knew all along he couldn't do it? He said to Moshe, make the menorah. And he said, I, 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 he tried, he couldn't. And then he shows him the picture, what it's supposed to look like, right? And Moshe still couldn't. Then Hashem had to do it. Do you hear? So wh why, is, why is Hashem asking Moshe to be involved in something he has no ability to do? God knows everything. Hashem knew five minutes earlier he's not going to be able to do it. 
The answer is, the answer is, it's the same vart, it's the same point as we hear over here in terms of reference to what happened and why Hashem made the world fully complete. And that is that Moshe Rabbeinu, he wouldn't necessarily, maybe yes, maybe no, be able to make the Menorah as Hashem had wanted him to do so. But if he didn't first have the image and the picture in front of him, what the thing is supposed to look like, what the finished product is supposed to look like, he's not even going to be able to start. Right? He's not even going to be able to, to begin the project. He's not going to be able to, to, you know, to go from A to B to C. And what am I bringing this out? Tonight we're speaking about different strategies that a person, a Jew, can follow to discover his way to greatness. And I'm here to tell you that one of the most essential characteristics is every Jew needs to have a Rebbe, a Rav, a Meiraderech, a person who's their rabbi, who is their spiritual mentor, to show them the way, how they're supposed to go. And the person we're supposed to pick and select to do so, we're supposed to pick an accomplished, spiritual, elevated, lofty person. Now, we may or may not be able to emulate him, or for a lady, we may not be able to em- she may not be a- able to emulate her. We may make it, we may not make it. But if we don't have in front of us the picture of a person who's accomplished in Torah and Midot and character traits and you're a Shemayim, right? If you don't have the picture at least in front of you, you're not even going to be able to get started and begin. Okay? That's the first thing I wanted to share over with you. Uh, discovering our path to greatness, you have to have a Rebbe in order to have a person in front of you who shows you what the tzura of the thing is supposed to be, what the form is supposed to look like. I want to share with you one other important point about having a mentor and a rav, which I think is very interesting. I was thinking about this recently. It's a funny but serious observation. You know, in America we have a famous expression. We say that a dog, a dog is a man's best friend. And have you ever stopped to think where that expression came from? So I think the reason is because the dog never criticizes us. It never asks you to pick up your socks off the floor. It never wakes you to go to Minyan, to Minyan, yeah? You know, <laughs> and it never makes you feel guilty. It never points out your weak spots. Of course the dog is your best friend. He's great. You know, he's easy. He doesn't ask anything of you. He doesn't demand anything of you, right? That might make us very comfortable. But in life, and certainly as Yidden, as Jewish people, we have to have stimuli in our life that are there to make us grow. The dog may be our best friend because he's nice to us and he doesn't bother us, doesn't ask anything of us, but we need to have a stimulus, a stimulus in our life, at least one, one person who's there to help us bring out our deeper potential. Now the second thing I'd like to share with you over tonight is the importance of being honest in our financial dealings, being honest in our financial dealings with other people, and how if a person is connected to this, they're definitely on the road to greatness as a Jew. The point I'm going to bring to you now, I heard from Rav Matisyahu Salomon Shlita, the famous Mashkiach of Lakewood. And he brings, in, in bringing out this point, he brings from something called the Smag, the Sefer Mitzvah Godel, Mitzvah Say number 74, Commandment 74. And this is what the Smag wrote long, long time ago. He said as follows, I'm going to read it to you, I translate it to English. He says, I have already spoken about this, what he's about to say, to the exiles of Yerushalayim, right, in Spain, and other places in the exile. He says, now that the Gaulists, the, stre- uh, the, the exile is stretching far too long, the Jewish people should turn away, he says, from worthless pursuits and worldly pursuits and embrace the seal of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, which is MS, Right? The exile's going too long, says the smog. We need to embrace MS. Then he says, we should not lie to other Jewish people or to the Gentiles or deceive them in any way at all. He says, we should sanctify ourselves and refrain from some things that are permitted. And then he concludes in the smog, this piece from the Novi Tzifania. There's a prophet Tzifania, one of the lesser known ones, but if you open Tanakh, he's there. And he says in chapter 3, verse 13, as follows. It says, the remnant of Israel, right, the remnant of Klal Israel will do no evil, nor will they speak falsehood, nor will, their deceitful, nor will deceitful tongues be found in their mouths. So what does this mean? So Rav Matizyahu Solomon explains a beautiful piece. Stick with me, you'll have a, a gorgeous Devar Torah. He says that when it talks about in Tanakh, the remnant of Israel, that expression, that's always referring to the Jews who are left in, in the Messianic times, right? When Mashiach comes, those Jews who are left, that's always called the remnant of Israel at the end of times. 
And that's what the prophet talks about. The remnant of Israel is going to do no evil. He's going to speak no falsehood, no deceitful tongues in our mouths. So the question is, why is it so important to upgrade our honesty so significantly as we approach the time of Mashiach? What is being honest and not being connected to falsehood? Why is this so important at the end of our exile that only the most honest are going to survive at the end. That's what the prophet's saying. You want to be from the Jews who are going to be at there at the end at the end of the ball game? You have to be from the honest ones, right? And we think, what about the other good things Jews do? Jews learn Torah, we learn Torah, we put on tefillin, we go to shul, give staka. What about them? Maybe that should be the schus by which we merit to be there at the end of the day. It's a fair question. So says Rav Matisyahu Salomon, a beautiful insight. He says, Hashem wants that the coming of Mashiach should be a Kiddush Hashem, right? It should be a Kiddush Hashem when Mashiach comes. The Smag explains that when Mashiach comes, the Goyim, the nations of the world, will praise Hashem for acting justly with us because we were truthful people. But if we act with deceit, you know what the Goyim are going to say when Mashiach comes? Says the Smag. He says, Oi! The non-Jews are going to say, look what Hashem has done. He has chosen for himself thieves and swindlers, right? See, the Goyim don't come to, into contact with us in the Beit Midrash, the Beit Medrash, the Yeshiva, the Kolel. They don't interact with us when we're buying an a $80 bumpy lemon for, a, for an etrog, an esterog for the holiday. They don't see us when we're you know, doing all these things. They don't know. They don't see. Where do they interact with us? You know where they interact with us? In the marketplace, you know? Whether it's in a store, whether it's in a, in a, in a restaurant, whether you're, you're working in the city, not in the city, wherever you are. That's where the goyim, that's where the non-Jews, that's where they interact with us. That's where they see us. That's how they get, form an opinion, what's a Jew and what's not a Jew. And if we act horribly there, at the place where we interface with the nations of the world, chas v'chalila, the coming Mashiach is going to be an enormous chilol Hashem, No? Enormous Chal Hashem, you say, Oy vey, these are the people Hashem chose. <laughs> oh, I remember them very well. I remember that business deal. I remember this. I remember that. Oh, I remember. I remember them very well. It'd be an enormous disgrace. And then they're going to ask, Why did Hashem choose the Jews? Because they're no different than we are at all, you know? It'd be a big disgrace. So if a person wants to go down the road of godless, of greatness as a Jew, he or she would be well served. To upgrade their honesty. We all believe as Jews that Mashiach is going to come much sooner than later. Like it says in my car mirror, objects in mirror are closer than they appear. We better well find ourselves amongst those Jews that the Smag and Rav Matis Yo are, 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 are warning us and cautioning us who are connected to Emes. Because Hashem says it's only the remnant of Israel who's going to be there at the end are going to be from the honest. The others are going to fall away because Hashem doesn't want a Chil Hashem when the Mashiach comes. Another area I'd like to address tonight is different areas we could all work on is strengthening our resolve and our commitment to not hurt the feelings of other people. This is something I shared recently in one of my, my weekly shiurim and I think it was, it's worth repeating. To bring out this point, I want to share with you a fascinating Gemara. This Gemara is found in Tractate Suvis on page 62b. I like to say the pages and sources in English. For those of you who like to look it up later with your art scroll Talmud or otherwise. The Gemara over here tells a story of a Rav. His name was Rav Rahumi. It says over there that every year it was his practice, he would come home to his wife. He would be off in yeshiva. Back then, people go to yeshiva for like a year at a time. People here go to... They go to an Or Sameach or Neisha Torah for two, three weeks. They think it's, it's like uh, Mashiach already. They're Mashiach. It's great. It's huge. It's a beautiful start. But, you know, back then, you know, like opening shot, you leave home for a year to sit in Yeshiva. He'd come home Erev Yom Kippur to his wife. And that's what he would do. And one time he got completely engrossed in his studies, very absorbed in his learning. He lost track of time. It happens to everybody. And Yeshiva Torah is delicious. You lose track. Happens to me. Happens to everyone. And he forgot to come home. Says the Gemara, his wife was looking out the window. And she said, oh, now he's coming. Oh, and now he's coming, you know. But he didn't come. And when he didn't come, the Gemara says she felt extremely sad. And a single tear fell from her eye. Now at that moment, her husband, who was a tzaddik, was sitting in an attic somewhere up in an attic, learning Torah in the base Medrash. Says the Gemara, at the moment that the tear fell, the attic collapsed where he was beneath him, 
and he, fe- and he fell down and he died. So the question is, why did this happen? Why did this happen to the guy? How is this proportionate? I mean, it's not nice. Your wife's waiting all year to see you. You don't come home. But, you know, and she felt sad and she had a tear. But, uh, you know, it's Chayv Misa. You have to die over it. So Rav Chaim Shemulevet Zatzal, the Mira Shiva, writes in his Sefer, the Sichos Musar, he addresses this in a very famous piece. He says as follows. He says, right, Rav Rechumi, he didn't die as a punishment for hurting his wife's feelings. Right? It didn't die as a punishment because if, if, if him being a little bit late you know, and missing this day would make, would make her sad, how much more so he's never going to come home again. Right? So it wasn't a punishment to him. Right? No. He says, just as, listen well to this, just as a person who sticks his hand in a fire right, will be burned, so too, said Rav Chaim Shmulevitz, a person who hurts their fellow's feelings will be harmed irrespective of the reason that it happened. Blame aside, intent aside, you hurt someone's feelings, Mamela, there's going to be a punishment, there's going to be consequences. You stick your hand in a fire on purpose, by accident, you're a baby, you didn't see it, you didn't know it was hot, whatever, right? You're going to be burned, you hurt someone else's feelings, there are going to be consequences as well. That's a natural, that's a natural flow of it. It's a, it's a cause and effect relationship. And as myself and as other Jews, I, I know and I'm sure every man in this room tries to grow in serving Hashem and being a better person, this is an area on the path to greatness that I'd respectfully suggest we all have to work on. It's something that we could all bear strengthening in the Zinyanim, in this area. Now, why do we hurt people's feelings? Why are we many times careless, right? Why are we careless? Why, why, why are we not more careful with the next guy's feelings? So I'll tell you a simple reason why. A lot of times they think it happens. It's not intentional. It's just we're mindless. We don't think. We don't mean anything. We're just, we just say something. We just do something. It's, it's a sin of omission, commission. We did. We didn't do. Just things happen, right? So I, it's not actually one of the Tariyag mitzvahs. Not one of the 613 mitzvahs. Thou shall not be mindless. Thou shall not walk around as a Jew without thinking. But if you had to add a 614th, it might be a good candidate, you know? You can't be a Jew and walk around without thinking. And, and, and my experience has been, and the learning I've done, that if a person is mindful and aware of your interactions, or whether it's when you're doing a mitzvah, what the mitzvah means and what it symbolizes, you have an extraordinary level of depth that you realize you just can't be mindless as a Jew. I want to give you one example. Today, right, today has been Sunday. Yeah, yesterday we had Shabbos. Baruch Hashem. I'm sure everybody had a beautiful Shabbos Kaidish. Now, some people sit at the Shabbos table, and you know what they do? You know what they think? Nothing. They think they're hungry. They think they're tired. They think they want to wolf down a meal, and they want to get under the covers as long as they can until either A, their kids wake them up, B, their wife wakes them up saying it's time that they take a nap, or C, you know, it's time to go back to Shul. Now, you could go through the Shabbos table, for example, and be going completely through the motions, or you can understand what the Torah says the Shabbos table really is. And I want to bring you just the Shabbos table as one example of if a person is being mindless, they're not even aware of what's in front of them. I want to give you a few examples from the Shabbos table from the Rishonim. The Magen Avram brings the Maril that explains the halacha that generally, ideally, your Shabbos table should have four legs. Did you know that? It says in Halacha that ideally your Shabbos table should have four legs. The Magen Avram brings us from the Maril. Why? Because the table with four legs, it's doim, it's comparable to the Shulchan, right? The, temp- the table in the temple, right? And that's what your Shabbos table represents, right? So it should have four legs like that at four legs. The Racha Shulchan explains that the candles, the Friday night candles, they represent the Menoira in the Beis HaMikdash, Right? You could look at the candles and think nothing. You could think of the menorah in the temple. The Shibola HaLeket and other Rishonim explain that the yayin, the wine that we drink, corresponds to the Nesachim, the wine that was brought with the Korbanis in the temple. right? And that the Zmirais, other Rishonim explain, corresponds to the Shira, the, the Shira song with the Korbanis. The Chala that we eat symbolizes, corresponds to Lechem upon him. You hear? You could be sitting at the Shabbos table, and aware, mindful, thinking as a Jew, 
if you've learned what it is, and now everybody at least knows what these things represent, right? From the Rishayim. You could be mindful. Wow, I'm sitting at the base of Mikdash. The food is like a carbon. The wine, the candles, the challah, it's unbelievable, right? I'm sitting, mamish, in the base of Mikdash. You could be just sitting there thinking like, wow, my wife made the same thing two weeks in a row, three weeks in a row, and the cholent's a little burnt, and uh, this and that, you know what I mean? And you just want to go to bed, you know? A Jew is not allowed to be walking around like a robot without thinking. And if we don't know what to think, got to learn. But whether it's Bein Adam L'chaveiroi, interacting with people and not hurting their feelings, or whether it's Bein Adam L'mokim, dealing with the mitzvahs, a Jew has to think. A Jew has to think. Now, the next thing I'd like to discuss a little bit is in, on the path to greatness, the struggle for spirituality. I'm blessed in my role through the Jewish Executive Learning Network, that I get to interact with hundreds of young professional men a year who are trying to grow and trying to upgrade and trying to, trying to change and trying to become more and bigger and better. Baruch Hashem, I'm blessed. I'm blessed to interact with such people. And I'll tell you, it's always a struggle. It's a fight for ruchnius, spirituality. It's always a struggle. It's a famous pasuk in, in the book of Yirmiya. Perak Beis, Pasuk Beis, many people know it. says, Zacharti lo chesna raich, avaz ke lo saich, lechtech achrai b'midbar ba'eretz lo yizarua. What does that mean? The Novi says, the Prophet says, Zacharti lo chesna raich, Hashem is telling Klal Yisrael, I remember um, the, the, the kindness that you showed when you were young, when you were new, like when we just got married, you followed me into the midbar, Hashem says, lechtech achrai b'midbar ba'eretz lo yizarua, in a land that wasn't sown, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't developed, and Klal Yisrael followed him. Now the famous stipler, Goin, most people have heard of the stipler. The stipler is a geval de gevard, an unbelievable piece. He says on this, Lechtech acharei midbar. right? We followed Hashem ba midbar. How was it that the Jews followed Hashem in the wilderness? The stipler pointed out, it doesn't just say, it says, Lechtech acharei l'midbar, we followed Hashem l'midbar, to the midbar. It says, we followed Hashem, Lechtech acharei ba midbar, we followed Hashem in the midbar. What does that mean? You know what that means? It wasn't that like one time we had one moment and we just get excited and got inspired. And we said, all right, we're following Hashem into the wilderness. Let's do it. Now what happened? They got excited and inspired one day. But every day it was work and it was a struggle. We followed Hashem bin Midbar, in the Midbar. And it was a struggle. And it was hard. Keep going, keep going, keep going. What are we going to eat and where are we going to go and what's the future? And with this, you should know the stipler discuss a famous question. Many people read in the Torah, they read that Hashem was very upset because did you know that the Jews at the time, they were thinking about and contemplating going back to Mitzrayim, right? They wanted to go back to Egypt. I'm sure some of you have seen that before in the Torah. They wanted to go back. Why would they want to go back to Egypt? I mean, would any person like, who got out of the concentration camps be like, you know, I'd like to go back to the concentration camps. Life was good there. Why would the Jews want to go back? To, go back? So you know what the stipler says? He says an unbelievable thing. He says Egypt was in ruins at the time. Mitzrayim was finished. Okay, There was no real political power. And the Jews, some of them thought, let's go to, let's go to Har Sinai. We'll have Matan Tyre. We'll get the Tyre at Har Sinai. And we'll go back. And we'll come back, and we'll be, we'll be there, and we'll, we'll, be in, uh, we'll be in Egypt, but it'll be a Torah state, it'll be from, it'll be payas and black hats, and tzitzis, and yarmulkes, and all the good stuff. And we'll make a Torah state in Egypt, and Egypt's a materially comfortable place, and we don't need to, go to, need to go to Israel, where it's materially difficult, and we'll be all set, it'll be great, we'll be ready to go, right? So every day the Jews had to make a decision. We're going to follow Shem in the Midbar every day. No, 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 no. We're going to push for a little more spirituality, a little more Kedusha, a little more sanctity. We're going to go to Israel where we can keep the Torah even better, even better, even better. And my friends, I think this is the journey that all of us go through, right? There's many times along the way you could say, I'm not saying a person should say, I'm going to go with a non-Jewish girl, God forbid, and uh, run around and eat pork. I'm speaking to men in this room who are interested in Judaism, who are connected to Ruchnias. I mean, my goodness, it's freezing out, right? I don't know, it's like three degrees in New York City tonight, you know, in Queens where we are. It's three degrees, you're out here. I think somebody told me today the NFL playoffs are going on. A lot of other things you could do with your time. A lot of other things you could do, watch, go, you know. But we're here, we're here. Why are we here? Nobody, I think, in this room is here because they're either going to be here or in a bar getting drunk, right? But you could be at home. 
could be at home doing your mitzvahs. Why do you come out, you schlep out to learn? Because every person's pushing for a little more kedusha, a little more holiness, a little more sanctity, a little push, a little push, a little push. Each one of us knows in our own personal lives how this Devar Taira applies, you know? But when we take the foot off the gas pedal, we have to understand that we're making an enormous mistake. And every day, it's a struggle. Push, 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 follow us on Ba Midbar, in the Midbar. The struggle never ends, but it's a journey that we have, to, we have to press on with. You know, it's been pointed out by some of the commentaries that the word neshama, right? The word neshama in Hebrew, it's nun, shin, mem, he, right? Neshama, the soul. Person's soul, the neshama, is those letters. It's been pointed out, uh, relatedly, that the word ha-shemen, the oil, the oil, let's say we just recently had Hanukkah, the oil, Hashemen, it's the same oisius, it's the same letters, right? Hashemen is hey, shin, mem, nun, and neshama is nun, shin, mem, hey, right? So why is Hashemen, the oil, the same letters as neshama? So I heard a great answer. What do they have in common? The answer is that both things lie below the surface, right? You see an, uh, you see an olive, uh, you don't see no oil, you just see an olive, right? You see, you see a person, you don't see no neshama, you don't see no soul, right? It lies below the surface. And to a person who's unlettered and never learned about it before, they most, both might seem like they don't exist. What do I see? I see a guy. I don't see no soul. I don't see no spark of God in him. I don't see nothing. <laughs> I just see a person. What do you see? You know what I mean? And you look at an olive. It's the same way. I don't see no oil, right? Both of them, to, on the surface level, might look like they don't exist, Right? And both of them, you can get them. You can reach it. You can access it. You can bring it out. But it takes a squeeze. You know what I mean? It takes a squeeze. How do you get out the oil, right, up from the olive? So you're going to have to squeeze. Cuss this. You have to squeeze it. You have to crush it a little bit. And if you want to bring out the neshama out of a person, you, you don't see it, you know, at surface level, you've got to squeeze it as well. It's got to push. You've got to push. You've got to push. Push in Ruchnius. You'll see the neshama come out. You'll see the person. You'll see. And that's why Hashem and neshama are the same oisius, the same letters, the same basic idea. Now, what I'm going to share with you now is a piece of Torah I haven't shared in a public forum uh, uh, yet, except I recently did share it at the Sheva Brachas of a person in this room. But I think it's Kedai. It's worth repeating. I want to say that a good question that a person has to ask themselves, every Jew has to ask himself, you want to go in the direction of godless, you want to go in the direction of greatness, ask yourself, are you willing to pay the price for greatness? So I'm from Lakewood, so I have to quote from the famous tzaddikim from Lakewood in every shir. Otherwise, when I go home tonight, a couple, you know, an hour 45 away, they'll throw me out of town, right? Only if the shir is posted on Torah anytime by then. So, so I want to tell you a part. So, uh, 10 years after Rav Aaron Cutler's Atzal, the famous Lakewood Roshiva, passed away, the Mashkiach Lakewood, Rav Nosen Vachsvogel, said the following in a hespid, in a, in a eulogy on his yard site 10 years after he died. The Gemara, the Talmud tells us, in Tractate Brachas, Dav Heyomar Aleph, page 5a, it says the following. It says that normally when a person sells an object, a person sells something, the one who sells it is sad because he doesn't have it anymore. And the one who acquires it, purchases it, he's happy. Says the Gemara, that's the way it works for Basar Vadam, people. Says the Gemara, by Hashem, ain't okay, by Hashem, it's not this way. How is it by Hashem? By Hashem, it works the opposite way. Right? Hashem, it, when he gave us the Torah, normally a person who sells or gives something, they're sad. Hashem was very happy he gave the Jewish nation the Torah. Yeah? Everybody follow so far? Said Rav Aaron Cutler and the Mashkiach Rav Nosson was quoting him. You see from this Gemara, you see from this Gemara, which discusses how Klal Yisrael received the Torah, it gives it over through the mashal, the Gemara Brachas, the Apheyam and Aleph, through the mashal of a sale, right? That was the analogy. That was the analogy, it was from a sale. person sells it, the one who sells is, is, is sad, and the one who buys is happy. Then the Gemara starts talking about that's how Hashem gave the Torah. Said Rav Aaron Cutler, that's how you see from here that any Kenyan of Torah, any acquisition of Torah, it has to come with a price. You want Torah, you have to pay the price. You got to pay the price. Now, when I say price, I don't even mean necessarily monetarily. But Torah comes with a price. The price that has to be paid. And I would add here, 
we have to ask ourselves, what price are we willing to pay for Torah? We want to be great, right? How much energy are we willing to give? How much time? How much koiches, right? I meet many people, many beautiful young men I'm, I'm privileged to learn with, who really want to become Tamir Chachamim. They want to be. I think they mean it. But you know what? They want to be Tamir Chachamim, but they're not willing to become Tamir Chachamim, right? You know, many people think they're going to sleep 8 to 10 hours a day the rest of their lives, you know, and get married, have kids, and somehow they're going to know Shas, they're going to know the whole Talmud backwards and forwards, and all the Rishonim, and all the Chreinim, and all the Paiskim, and everything. They're going to know it all, you know, and, and, but they're going to sleep always, and it's always going to work, you know. I don't know anybody who knows a lot, a lot of Torah who doesn't kill themselves for it, right? That's the way it works. You have to pay a price. Sometimes the price is, is personal, professional, financial, sleeping, health, stress, but you have to pay a price if you want to have greatness in Tyra. A lot of people I interact with on a daily basis, I find, they, in general, I'm not just talking Tyra now, they want things in life, but you know what? They're not willing to pay the price. Yeah? They're not willing to pay the price for the things they want in life. And I'll give you an example. I sometimes meet people and they tell me they want to lose weight. They want to be thin. I say, okay. So I tell them, okay, you could do it. But are you willing to pay the price? They say, what do you mean? I have to go to Weight Watchers? I said, no, no, not that kind of price. It's a price you have to pay, right? You will have to exercise and you cannot eat what you want. If you eat whatever you want, whenever you want, to your full satiety, you will not be thin. It just doesn't work that way. I've tried it. Others have tried. It doesn't work, right? You can't eat whatever you want. So you want to be thin, you've got to pay the price. Are you willing to pay the price? Yes, no. So some people are willing to pay the price, short term, three weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, and that's why they lose weight a little bit, you know? But they're not willing to pay the long-term price. So I, think, I know people who have made a lot of money in life, and I think most people can become very affluent if they're willing to pay the price. But you have to pay the price. It's going to cost you in terms of relationships, health, family time, stress, Torah learning, community involvement, but you can have it, just got to pay the price, you know? So this is the idea. Anytime you're gunning for greatness, you have to ask yourself, am I willing to pay the price? Am I willing to pay the price of admission? Yes or no? Everything has its own price. But, and, but tonight we're going to focus on the Torah perspective. Don't ever think that you'll achieve any measure of godless betoyer, greatness in Torah, if you're not willing to kill yourself over it. And the Gemara and the Medrash in different places say so. You have to respect the exchange rate, right? If you go to, go to a country, right, and you say, okay, here's $100, give me, you know, 12 gazillion euros or this many shekels, they're going to laugh at you. This is an exchange rate. You want that in exchange, you got to, you know, you got to pay back. I'm in Queens tonight. When I was looking for a parking spot, I saw a lot of beautiful houses, yeah? I know the Queens housing, a lot of it's expensive, a lot of these beautiful houses. Imagine you go... You go with a real estate agent and you tell the guy, you know, listen, I, I, I think my wife and I would like to make an offer. Um, uh, you know, um, we're willing to make a, pay a check for you know, $86,000. He's like, okay, that's great. So that'll get us close to the 10% down. But nowadays, most banks want 20% down. So, uh, you know, like, you want the house, but, you know, you got, there's an exchange rate here. It's not going to work. One more source on this idea of how much we're willing to push for Tyra. I'll tell you, there's an interesting Medrash, Medrash Rabbah tells us about the Navi Yecheskel, Yecheskel, Ezekiel. Anybody know what his full name was when he was called up to the Torah? Ya'amoid, Hagoina Rav, Yecheskel Ben. His, last name was Yeche- his name was Yecheskel Ben Buzi, right? So how did he get that name? And it says, it says that he was the son of people who were willing to be mavaza themselves, embarrass themselves for Torah. Buzi is like the word, like bizoyan, embarrassment, shame, disgrace, right? He was willing, so that's where he came from. Where did this great righteous prophet come from? From people who were willing to embarrass themselves and push themselves for Tyra. That's where he came from. Okay. Now, when a person is trying to grow, improve, change, become great, one of the barriers we hit is we start to make a lot of excuses, right? Excuses. People like to smirk when I talk about the excuses because they can all nod their heads so far, but then the excuses start to kick up. 
And I'd like to spend a few moments speaking about the excuses that a lot of time impede a person from impede, uh, reaching their goals. And I shared this once in a different shear. It's on the online archives. I shared it once, maybe six months ago, but it's worth repeating. There's a Rashi in Parshas Hazinu that tells us the following. It tells us there's an expression in the Torah called Be'etzim Hayoyim Hazeh. And we're going to explain right now what is Be'etzim Hayoyim Hazeh. So what does Rashi tell us at the end of the Torah? Be'etzim Hayoyim Hazeh means that something happened, Be'etzim Hayoyim Hazeh means that it happened in the middle of the day, almost like in broad daylight, right? That something was happening in the middle of the day and that all the people in the world who might try to stop something from happening can't stop it. Hashem's doing it in high noon. Be'etzim Hayoyim Hazeh. Broad daylight, you can't stop it from happening. Rashi brings three examples of Be'etzim Hayoyim Hazeh and the Chumash. What are they? Number one, when Noah, Noyach, went into the Teva, the Ark, it says he went in Be'etzim Hayoyim Hazeh. Right? Why? Because all the people of the world didn't want him to go in. They didn't want him because they knew, uh-oh, the flood's coming, right? And so now they see it's raining. This isn't going to be good. So they tried to stop him from going, and they said, we're going to break the ark, we're going to smash it to pieces. Hashem said, no, be'etzim ayom hazeh. High noon, you guys are going in, you're going in with the animals. Nobody could stop it. That's one be'etzim ayom hazeh. Second one, when the Jews left Mitzrayim, that's the Torah portions we're reading now, when the Jewish people left Egypt, it says they left be'etzim ayom hazeh. You can understand also the same context. Why would it be that the Egyptians didn't want them to leave? Who wants millions of people to just leave? Who wants millions of free laborers to leave the country, right? They didn't want it to happen. But what happened? Hashem says, no, you're going to leave Be'etzim Ayom in the middle of the day. You're not going to sneak out. Nobody's going to stop you. What's the third example Rashi brings? The third Be'etzim Ayom that Rashi brings is the example of when Moshe was going to die. When Moshe was going to die, the people didn't want him to die. And the Hashem says he was going to take back his soul. And even if all the Jewish people try to stop Moshe from dying, not going to work. Okay. Now there's a great mashkiach in Eretz Yisrael, Rav Moshe Aaron Stern's at Sal, And he asks a very, very good question. Pay attention, this is a great Tavar you'll have for life. Here we go. Rav Moshe Aaron Stern asks a good question. He said like this. There's another Be'etzim Ayayim in the Torah that doesn't seem to fit this pattern that Rashi says. Where is it? The Torah says that when Avram Avinu, Abraham, was like 99 years old, he's obviously an advanced age, right? He's going to have a bris milah. He's going to have a circumcision, right? He's a, a much older person. He's a guy in his 90s and he's going to have a bris milah, circumcision. And the Torah says when he had the bris milah, it's Be'etzim Ayayim right? It happened in the, in the middle of the day, and nobody could stop it. So the obvious question is, how does this fit in with our pattern, right? How does this fit in with our pattern? I understand why people wouldn't want Moshe to die, or they wouldn't want the flood to start, and they wouldn't want the Jews to leave Egypt, right? But who cares, right? And I use this example all the time. We're in Queens tonight. If you hear there's a guy in his 90s who's somewhere in Queens, and he decides he wants to take a, a knife and cut a little bit off, off his earlobe tonight, are we all going to be like, no, let's stop him, you know? We're going to run and we're going to chase the guy down. No, don't let it happen. Hashem's going to say, no, no, it can't stop. It has to be. We think the guy's crazy and we leave him alone. <laughs> he wants to hurt himself, let him hurt himself. He wants to give himself a procedure, let him. Who cares? Fair question? Good question. Moshe Aaron Stern asked this for Kasha. So he said like this. He said a beautiful vart which directly bears on, on the path to greatness and trying to elevate ourselves. He said like this. He says a lot of times in life, guys, we walk around and our mouths are filled with excuses. Why I don't learn more. Why I don't daven more. Why I'm not a better person. Why I'm not a better husband. Why I don't give more tzedakah. Why I'm not this. Why I'm not that. Whatever it is, our mouths are filled with excuses morning to night. People are filled with excuses. And you know what? We're very comfortable with them. But you know when our, ex our excuses fall apart? You know when they fall apart? When you meet a person who comes from the exact same background or circumstances as you do, or worse perhaps, and they're able to overcome and accomplish despite those circumstances, your excuse melts away. Does that make sense? Your excuse melts away. So what happened over here? The people back then, they were running around in the time of Avram like mamish, literally like wild animals, you know? They were hungry, they would eat. They were thirsty, they would drink. They were tired, they would sleep. 
and uh, they had a, a sexual urge, they would express it nicely, not like whatever. It just it is what it is, you know. That's how they were. No kedusha. Everything is what it is. A human being is an animal, just you know, with the, sometimes with table manners, not much more, right? And what happened? Comes Avram Avinu, comes Abraham, and he does the bris milah. And it's not for tonight to go into it at length, but the bris milah, why did Hashem want it done there? Because he was taking an area, right, that people would basically act very physical, very coarse, mom is almost like an animal, and infusing kedusha and holiness into it, right? So now you understand, says Rabbi Meishar and why did the people, why is it that they didn't want the bris milah to go down? Because the people were very happy and comfortable in the Haran and, the, and in the ancient times running around acting like however they acted, right? But you see somebody who came from the same background, the same idolatrous background, the same junky Jewish background, <laughs> and what happened? He brings holiness to his life and he's great and he's Kaddish and everything else. Oh, they didn't want it to happen. They didn't want it to happen because once somebody from their background could do it, what would happen to their excuse? Their excuse would go in the garbage bin, right? Their excuse would melt away. And that's why, that's why Hashem made it that the bris milah had to happen also and that's why the people wouldn't want it to happen, right? What's Nogeya and Yanenu? What's most relevant to us? In addition to the fact that I think it's a pretty interesting Tavar Torah, what's relevant to us is that when we're trying to grow and we're trying to change, we would be well served to look for people who come from the same kind of background as us and had the same adversity and some of the same circumstances growing up in life and to see people who were able to make it, right? Many of the men I understand in this room are balei tshuva, and I think that's amazing, that's very inspirational, it's beautiful, right? But you, you know, a person should never say, I'll never be able to learn Gemara. I'll never be able to learn with that in art school. I'll never be able to learn Gemara, Mishnah Gemara, Rashi Tyson in the Mara Shah. No, you know, no, I'll never be able to. You know, people from my background, they can't. Don't walk around with that excuse. I guarantee you, in this neighborhood alone, you can find hundreds of people who came from the same background or worse who are able to do it. You could do it. We could do it. We all could do it, right? But that's a very, very important strategy. Find someone who's done it. Because then your excuse will melt away. And you want it to melt away. Because otherwise, if you didn't want to be great and accomplished, I don't think you would be out here tonight listening to this shir. And once we find our clarity, Rabosai, once we find the clarity we're looking for and the greatness we're trying to achieve, the next avoid, the next job we have to work on is we have to keep the clarity, Right? Because we all have moments, no, that we have the clarity. Oh, I got it. This is what I'm meant to do. This is why I'm in this world. This is what Hashem wants. I'm never going to sin again. Tunnel vision, right? And it lasts for a little bit and it doesn't always last, right? So I want to talk to you about keeping clarity. And I want to tell you, you know who was a classic figure in, in the Torah, and Tanakh, really, who kept his clarity and focus? It was David Amelech. I want to bring you a beautiful word from the Chafetz Chaim in which he discusses this. There's a famous Pasik, famous verse many of us know. It says, Acha King David says, One thing I ask of the Rabbi Shalaylam, Shifti Beveis Hashem Koyme Chayai, that I want to sit and dwell in the house of Hashem, the base Medrish, all the days of my life, right? That's what he said. That was his request. So the Chafetz Chaim says something very interesting. Do you know when David Melech began with this request, right? Acha Shoalti, one thing I want of God, that's all. You know when he began with this? He began when he was a simple guy, right? Early in his life, when he was a humble shepherd, and there was a time in his life when his brothers rejected him, and they didn't even think he'd ever amount to anything. At that point in his life, he was already saying, Acha Shoalti, this is the only thing I want. Said the Chafetz Chaim, David HaMelech, he never changed his request of Hashem. No matter how great he became in life, he never changed his request. He never changed his request. He kept going with it, right? In the future, he became a Melech, a king, involved in politics and the wars and economy and national problems. And you know what? He never changed his request. Still later in life, what did he want? He had the clarity. Acha Shawalti, I want one thing. I want to be in base Medrash. I want to be connected to Hashem and his Torah. And the Chafetz Chaim gives a beautiful mushal, a beautiful parable. Listen to what he says. He says there's a, a, an oni, a pop, a pauper, right? And he has no food and he has no home. Nebuch. So 
Comes Yom Kippur, he goes to Shul, he asks Hashem, please give me a little food to eat and a little roof over my head this year. That's all I want, a little, a little food, a little roof. And Baruch Hashem, Hashem responds and gives it to him, right? Next year he comes back to Shul and he goes, you know Hashem, this year you gave me a, a roof and some food. Can I have this year, like, you know, instead of having a, a little, little hut I rent, can I have like a, a home that I can like, you know, own? And maybe instead of just enough food that I'm not starving, maybe like some tasty food, you know? And Hashem gives it to him. So on and so forth. Every year his material requests would increase, right? A change with his status in life. Says the Chafetz Chaim, by David HaMelech, it wasn't like this at all, right? David HaMelech wanted to be close to Hashem when he was nobody and he wasn't famous and he wasn't important. He was chasing around the Shepsel as the little sheep. <laughs> That's what he was doing. That's what he wanted, to be close to Hashem. Toy, retire, retire. That's what he wanted. And when he became the most famous, powerful person in the world, that's what he still wanted. Toy, retire, retire. As his circumstance changed, says the Chafetz Chaim, his request didn't change. And that clarity, that clarity is something that we have to attain. A lot of times in life, while we're not making much money, or we have more free time on our hands, we might have a, an insight or an inspiration to go in the way of Hashem and Torah. And we might, you know, especially when we're young. And then what happens, a lot of things can come your way. Professional, financial, familial, all kinds of pressures. And you might not want that anymore. But, but really, deep down, you do want it. It just... You're distracted. You have to remember the lesson of Dovod HaMelech. Part of his godless, says the Chavetz Haim. Dovod HaMelech's greatness is he had the clarity to understand what he wanted when he was young and to maintain that focus and inspiration moving forward. One of the challenges we have to becoming the Jews that we're all capable of becoming is that we have a tendency to misuse the gifts that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us. Hashem gave all of us gifts, beautiful gifts, and instead of using them for, for His honor and to serve Him, many times we abuse them. Some commentaries point out that the word Shefa, Shefa, which means a flow or abundance, it's the same letters in Hebrew as the word Pesha, which means a sin, right? They both have a Pe, a Shin, and an Ayin. So what's the connection between Shefa and Pesha? Flow, abundance, and sin. A person can take the great advantages and blessings that Hashem gave you and you could use them against them. You can turn them into something sin sinful. And when a person's trying to do tshuva and upgrade, we have to look at the blessings Hashem gave us, whether when we were young or more recently. We have to look to see, did we take these gifts that He gave us and do we use them against them? And we have to know that the Torah tells us a strategy that we can use and implement to take those brachas that Hashem did give us and to keep them, and to use them, and then he'll want to continue to give them to you. And I'll share with you a, a, much, a much less known medrash from the Yalkut Shemoini on this point. The medrash says in the Yalkut Shemoini, on the book of Rus, section 607, for those of you who are going to run to the Svarim shelf and look it up after this year. This is the medrash. The medrash says a, le, a little known story, but it's very interesting. The medrash says, tells a story of a, a chassid, doesn't mean he was Hasidic from Brooklyn. It means he was a pious person, right? But he had pious, like, uh, I don't know who, pious, P-I-O-U-S. The Hasidim call it pious, the pious, but I'm not trying to be funny, but that's, I didn't mean to make a joke. But he was a pious person, a Hasid, and he lost his money, and he had to take a much lesser job, the Medrash says, and he was working in the fields. And Eliyahu Hanavi came to him, Elijah the prophet came to him, dressed in the form of an Arab, Okay? So careful if Arabs come talk to you, it could be Elio and Navi, right? And, and Elio and Navi, dressed as an Arab, said to him, you're going to be blessed with six financially successful years. Do you want to take them now, or do you want to take them at the end of your life? Your choice, now or end of your life, when do you want to have them? So the guy thought he was crazy. So he said, get out of here, you Arab, or whatever. You know, stop bothering me. I got work to do, you know? But he kept coming back, and he came three times to Medrash. says, at the end, the chassid goes, you know, I'm going to ask my wife. What does she think? Because she was a very holy lady. The Medrash says that she said, no, take it now. Take it now. Lo and behold, they found the treasure, the Medrash says, and they became rich. Now the lady, says the Midrash, gave the money to Tzedakah every single day. And her son kept very, very accurate records of what they gave. Six years later, Elio and Navi, Elijah the prophet, came back. Came back and he goes, you know, it's been, it's been six years. You know, a deal is a deal. A vart is a vart. We say in Yiddish, word's a word. Time to get it back. 
So the Medrash says that this lady goes over to this booklet she has and she brings out the records and she shows a Leo and Navi everywhere she gave tzedakah and to whom and in what amount and so on and so forth, right? It says the Medrash, and these are the words of the Medrash, she challenged him. She said, if you could find anyone who would have used this gift more faithfully than, than my husband and I and my son, take it. It says the Medrash, Leo and Navi says, you know, Taka, I, we can't find anybody, you know, who would have used this money any better in this time. So says the Medrash, they were allowed to keep the money and they were able to keep it the rest of their lives. So what was the secret that this wise woman knew? And why am I bothering you with this tonight in Queens? I'll tell you why. Because when we look at the brachas that Hashem has given us, whether it's health, whether it's knowledge of Torah, whether it's great relationships, family, all the different brachas we can have, we, you know, it would be nice to have a strategy whereby we can figure out how to keep it, right? The Torah is telling us what the strategy is, right? You want to go on the road to greatness, you have to have your weapons, you have to have your tool chest, right? How do you hold on to your tool chest on the road to greatness and accomplishment? The answer is, the Medrash says, you have to make sure that you're using them wisely. Kodesh Baruch Hu, Hashem looks at us like an investment, right? I interact with a lot of young professionals, many of whom work on Wall Street, and they're busy, a lot of them, and they're busy investing. If you give money, let's say $10,000 to three different companies that are thinking of launching, and they all launch, right? Six months later, you look at your investment. This one made me a profit of $1,000. This one made me a profit of $5,000. And this one lost my $10,000, right? So now that six months later, you want to put in another $10,000 or $30,000, where are you going to invest it, right? The one who's turning a profit, right, for you, that's where your investment's going to go. You should really know that's why it's not that different, that marshal, from the way Hashem acts with us as well. We have to look at ourselves, you know, as we're trying to become better people. Are we taking the brachas that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us and are we using them? Is Hashem makes an investment in us. Life, health, success, parnasa. Every second that we don't just die or evaporate, says, it says in Sfarim and Kabbalah Sfarim, other Sfarim, it's because Hashem's pumping life into you. He's investing in you. What are you doing with it? Are you using it well or are you not using it well? And to what degree and how could you use it better? But says the Medrash in the Yalkut Shemaini and Rus, if you use it correctly, you, you can, you can count, uh, count on it that a Kaddish Baruch is probably going to let you keep the blessings for the long run. Now I want to share with you a couple thoughts about the topic of suffering. Because I don't know that many people who don't have what we call tsaris, who don't have problems, who don't have tsar, who don't have aggravation, who don't have suffering. And I know people who have financial suffering and, and social suffering and, and, or marital suffering or, or, or professional. People have tsaris, we say. People have a lot of problems, a lot of yusur and a lot of suffering. So I want to share with you an insight that I recently saw. And when I saw this, to me, this was like the kind of Devar Torah you sometimes see, which I consider to be a game changer. You know what I mean? That you think, wow, that's the kind of Devar Torah. When you hear that, that could change your life. So I'm grateful to Hashem for letting me see that piece. I want to share with you that piece now. Because on the road to greatness, you know, you, you can take a lot of punches, you know, along the way. And it can make you say, ah, forget it. I'm going to just, you know, crawl into a ditch and just uh, <laughs> call it a game. So I saw this, this also, this vart comes from the Chafetz Chaim. Chafetz Chaim wrote a lot of Sfarim, most people know the Mishnah Brura, Chafetz Chaim, Shemir Saloshan, but he wrote a lot of Sfarim. This Sefer from the Chafetz Chaim, it's called Shem Ailam, and he writes this at the very end of Perek Gimel, chapter 3. Listen to the Chafetz Chaim. He says as follows. He says that he heard this from a certain Jew, heard this from a certain person, who basically heard it from the Vilna Gon, who was his grandfather. Okay, so from a person, from a person, back to the Vilna Gon. What did the Vilna Gon say? It says like this. It says that when a person passes away, and I'm quoting almost word for word, right? I'm trying to go through the text in my mind and quote for you. When a person passes away, and their neshama, their soul, goes up to Shemayim, says the Chofetz Chaim in the name of the Vilna Gon, they see upstairs... They see the, the shape, sort of the tzura, the form of, a, of scales. Like, you know, like the scales. Um, like, sort of like the scales of judgment. I'm an attorney. So, you know, I, it's a common thing you see on business cards, right? Advertisements, the scales, right? See the scales, that's what they see. And the person sees that. 
Said the Chafetz Chaim, in the name of the Vilna Gain, a baskoil, a tremendous voice rings out in Shemayim in heaven and says, all the merits, all the schusim, all the maizim toivim, all the Torah and mitzvahs and good deeds a person did, let it come. And it comes and it sits on the right side of the scale. Then a second baskoil, a second tremendous voice in heaven says, let all the avoidness, all the sins, all the transgressions, all the averas a person did in their life, let them come now and let them go on the left side of the scale. Said the Chofetz Chaim, many people are going to be shocked to discover that it's a little bit close. It's a little bit more evenly keeled, a little more evenly balanced than you might have expected, than you might have even known. You might be shocked. You go, oh boy. And why? Says the Chavetz Chaim. It's because many times when we do our mitzvahs, they don't weigh as much as they should. We'll go to Shul and Davin, but we're not even paying attention to the words, you know? The mitzvah doesn't weigh too much, you know? You might go to a Torah class. Instead of 60 minutes, you get 60, 60 minutes of listening. You paid real attention for 28 minutes, you know? Your mitzvahs might not weigh as much as you think. But on the flip side, the Averas, ooh, they weigh a little bit more than you think sometimes. While the mitzvahs we didn't do with kavon, excitement, the sins, sometimes we did a little too much excitement, a little too much enthusiasm, you know? And, 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 and they weigh a lot. So what happens? A person's looking at the scale right after they die, and this is really what happens. And they're frightened. They say, Oi vey, oh no, they're going to sentence me to a, a place that's hotter than Miami in August, you know? <laughs> it's, it's not going to be pretty. I'm from South Florida, so I know what that means. Take a shower, what's the point? You go to your mailbox 20 feet away, you sweat already, you know? <laughs> And, and the person thinks he's finished. What happens next? Says the Chofetz Chaim, a third voice rings out in Shemayim and says, let all the Yisurin, all the suffering that the person went through in their lifetime, let it come now as well. And you know where it goes? It goes on the right side of the scale. It's added on to the right side on the mitzvah side. And for many people, it will weigh it down and tilt them onto the side of merit and the person's life will be saved. And the Chavetz Chaim concludes this piece in Shem Oilam, and the chapter 3 by saying, and at that moment, a person will thank a Kodesh Baruch Hu for all the suffering and all the problems and all the pain they had in their life. You're going to thank Hashem. You're going to thank Him. Because that very stuff that you had to go through, at the time you're thinking, why me? After you're going to think, Whew, you know, I wouldn't even mind it if He had spooned over a, you know, a cup a little bit more. Because in the end, it's what saves you. In the end, it's what saves you. How is it what saves you? Now, the Chavetz Chaim doesn't say it fully directly. I'd like to suggest it's because many times when we don't perform up to our potential and achieve our greatness, it's because the backdrop against it, against which we're trying to perform, so much pain, so much hurt, so much disappointment, so many things are stacked against us, right? We're all going to have pain in our lives. I hope for, mo for all of you that almost all of it, if not all of it, is behind you. But we're all going to have it. And the attitude that we carry forward in how we relate to it and how we deal with it, it's crucial. You know, you, people will say things about you in life that aren't true. People will say things you did that you didn't do. People will hurt your name. People will hurt your reputation. People will hurt you financially. And not just by Shacharis time, you know. It's rough out there, right? It's rough out there in this world. But you should know, bear in mind what the Chafetz Chaim said. Try to take it. Try to swallow it. Try to take it with a smile. Because Achramei of Esrim, it could be the very thing that helps spare you and spare your life. I want to share with you something fascinating. And I know I'm getting close to my hour-ish, but if, am I okay a few more minutes? Yeah. If you want to leave, I'm not offended. I know you might have somewhere to go. It's okay. I'll keep going. I'll keep going until, uh, until, we, uh, until they, they, tell, they shut off the lights. Yeah? <laughs> so, Rav Shach Zatzal, Rav Elozim Menachem An Shach Zatzal, Rashiva, Rashiva Ponovich, God Lator. He used to often cite a medrash, and I want to bring to you this medrash, because it deals with really the core of what is a yid, dealing with yisur and suffering. He often would cite the medrash. This medrash was, is brought by the base Yosef. If you open the Arbaturim, the Tor, you see this, this medrash brought by the base Yosef, and Orachayim, Simen Reish Tarek Beis, that's 292. What does he say? We know in Shabbos and Mincha, it, there's special words. In the Shabbos Mincha, Shmon Esrei, it says, Abraham Yagel, Yitzchak Yiranein, Right? Sephardim say that too? Yeah? Okay, good. Just making sure. There's a lot of different sitters, Baruch Hashem and Klal Yisrael, making sure. 
So he says, Abraham, Yagel, Yitzchak, Yarnain, Yaakov, Bonav, Yachon, Uvoy. What does that mean? So I translated, I looked in a sitter to make sure I would translate it right. Abraham rejoiced, and Yitzchak sang glad song. So what's this happy song that Yitzchak was singing? What was the happy song he was singing? You know what he was singing? Says the Medrash and the Beis Yosef cites it. The song Yitzchak was singing was at the moment that he was being taken by Abraham to be shechted, to be slaughtered, to become a carbon sacrifice. He was singing the song that accompanied the carbonus, the, the offering from the base Hamikdash. That's what it means. Abraham Yitzchak That's what Yitzchak was singing about. You hear what that means? You hear when you found out he was going to be the he was the sheep. He was going to be slaughtered. He burst into song. What does that mean? It means a Jew needs to understand that no matter what happens to us and what Hashem throws our way, even if it's going to cost us our lives, we have to be besimcha. We have to be happy we're Jews. And we still feel close to Hashem no matter what He throws our way. You have to be, you have to be happy about it. And you have to go with a song. You'll never, if, you, if you think about that, think about that, you can, you, can, you can deal with almost anything. We don't have too much time left. I just want to share with you a couple ideas. To me, one of the most important ideas that can help a Jewish person develop his or her potential is to understand that life is finite. You cannot take it with you. You're not going to live forever. You're not going to be here forever. And once you have that, as we say in Yiddish, klar, you have a klarikite, you have a clarity on that, now you're ready for action. It says in Parsha B'Shalach, which we're going to read in a few weeks, here's an early Devar tire for you for that Parsha coming up. Parsha B'Shalach, it says, Vayikach Moshe is Atmos Yosef Imoy, that Moshe took the remains, the bones of Yosef with him. Why? Because when Yosef died, he made the Jewish people promise to take a shvu, an oath, that when Moshe would die, that, excuse me, when Yosef would die, that the bones would be taken and, you know, reinterred in Eretz Yisrael, right? So says the Kliyakar, Kliyakar says there's a word there that seems superfluous. Vayikach Moshe, it's Atmos Yosef Imoy. Moshe took the remains of Yosef, Imoy, with him. So let's break it down. Moshe, well, we need Moshe. You need to know who it is. Right? Vayikach, Moshe. Moshe took. You need to know he took. Right? Es, Atmos, Yosef. You have to know it's the bones of Yosef. Imoy, with him, seems to be extra, says the Kliyakar. Why? Because in Imoy, right, it's one word in Hebrew, two words in English, with him. It's obvious if Moshe took the remains, the bones of Yosef, obviously it's with him, right? If we said... Joe took the cell phone. It's obviously with him, right? Now with someone else, right? So why does it say that? Good question. So it says the Kliyakar. Vayikach Moshe Tzatzim Yosef. Moshe took the remains of Yosef. If it just said Moshe took the remains of Yosef, it means he took it in this world. He moved it from here to here. Imoy with him, it's Leraboy, so it comes to include he took it to Elam Abba. He took the merit of the, and the reward of being involved in a mitzvah Imoy with him. You hear? So, uh, this Kliyakar is one of the places that you see where it's alluded in the Chumash that you take the reward of a mitzvah with you to the next world. Yeah? That's what you take with you. And as a little kid, I wasn't observant growing up. I, I, I observed what I knew, my, what my parents gave me. I started learning Torah later in life. And I remember when I first started learning, one time I saw, I found uh, on the floor somewhere, and I, it, like this little hourglass, right? You know the kind of hourglass that comes with a board game? You know, it's like a little sand, and you flip it over, and if it lasts 30 seconds, 60 seconds, and what it was. I was looking at it, and I realized that life is very much like that. You know, you have a certain amount of sand in the top, right? Represents how much time you have in this world. And then afterwards, the sand is going down, and you don't know how much time you have, right? But the difference is that, unlike a normal hourglass, little like in a game, um, the hourglass of life is covered on top, right? The top half is covered. So all you know is that you see the sand falling. All you know is you have less time today and tomorrow, you know, and next week than, than you ever had before. You know you're running out of time. You know you have less than you used to. You just don't know how much time is left on the top part, right? I was thinking that's it's a, it's a big piece of musr because we don't know how much time we have left in this world. It's time to get moving. It's time to grow. Time to push. Time to accomplish what we need to accomplish. I brought you something for show and tell, right? Uh, which I don't normally do in a share, but I think it's Kadai. I think it's worthwhile. If you think I brought a pair of tefillin, no, there's not a pair of tefillin in here, okay? And I'll show this to you after if you'd like to see it more closely, okay? This is a very old Kiddush cup, okay? 
This Kiddush cup, I'm gonna, I'll tell you another time the story how I attained it. It's a 230-something-year-old Kiddush cup, okay? Um, it it's, was made in 1780. Uh, it's from Eastern Europe. It's a whole story what's behind it, okay? It's a very, very cool Kiddush cup. Um, the name of the person who was the owner is, is actually engraved on here. His name was Shmariyahu Isaacson, okay? Now, what do I want from this Kiddush cup, okay? I'll tell you what I want. First of all, you see from here that this Kiddush cup, if I told you I bought it in, in, in Brooklyn last week, you'd probably believe me, you know? It looks like a normal Kiddush cup. Because Judaism never changes and mitzvahs never change. You know what I mean? The Kiddush we make today is like the Kiddush they made, right, in 1780, which is like the one they made in 1480, at, right, and 1480 before the Common Era. And Yiddishkeit never changes, right? I want to tell you something else. You know what this Kiddush cup means to me? This guy's name, for whom, to whom it belonged, Shmario Isaacson, let me ask you, do you think anybody even knows who he is? Do you think anybody remembers him? Do you think, I, I doubt Anybody has any idea who this guy was, where he lived, where he was, was born, where he died, how many kids he had, you know, what he looked like, what he did for a living. Nobody remembers this guy. The only zecher, the only remembrance that this guy has left in this world is the mitzvah he was involved with. I don't know what he did to make his kiddush special, but somehow he merited, right, that his kiddush cup would be remembered and that, I don't know, it would be broadcast in Torah anytime to hundreds of people and everything else, you know? I don't know. But this Kiddush cup to me symbolizes this idea that mitzvahs are the only thing you get to keep. That's the only thing you get to take with you, right? And a person would do well to get that idea into their head today and tonight and immediately because every single one of us, like the hourglass muscle, has less time than we ever had before to make good on that. And just, I want to be Messiah in a moment. I want to conclude with a mushal. This, this mushal comes from the Akdama to the introduction to the Sefer called Nesivei Chinuch by the Slonim of Rebbe Zatzal. And he brings this mushal from the Kajnitzer Magid. He says like this, there was a king. There was once a king. All the good mushals start with a king, right? There was a king, and he was very depressed. Why? Because there was a mass rebellion amongst the subjects of his kingdom, right? He was very depressed. There was a big rebellion in his kingdom. However, a small group of citizens rose up and they pledged allegiance to the king and they swore that they would remain loyal to the king to their very last drop of blood. Now this pledge was a great source of nechama, consolation and comfort to the king. Why? Said the Slonim Rebbe, had this pledge been taken during normal times, it would make the king feel good, Right? But since it was made at a time when so many people were openly rebelling against the king, the pledge of this group was extremely valuable and heartening to him. What's the nimshal? What's the point of the mushal? We see in our own times, guys, that so many people are not interested in Tyra, have rebelled against, you know, the king of kings, right? Akadosh Baruch Hu. Some intentionally, some accidentally, many out of ignorance, right? So in a normal time, a person saying, I'm going to be loyal to the king of kings, the Kodesh Baruch Hu, it's good, right? But when we live in a world when so few people are devoted to Torah, to Hashem's honor, to Kiddush Hashem, that commitment, Kav Yachl, gives them tremendous, tremendous meaning. We who are left, we are the remnant of Klal Yisrael, who is committed to Torah, is committed to Yerushalayim, is committed, we're all a Kodesh Baruch Hu has left in this world. And I can guarantee you that if we will strive for spiritual greatness and work on some of these inyanim that we've been speaking about tonight, not only will continue to be a source of nachas to Kaddish Baruch Hu, but as the smog spoke about, will be those who will be there at the end of the day and be there when Mashiach comes, will be part of the great revelation and the reboy in Kvayt Shemayim, the great increase in Hashem's honor. I thank you for having me. I thank you for listening. And I hope we'll do it again. Good night.